Okay, to start our second video of the or second lecture of the week on video this time, um, we'll pick up where we left off in the beginning of or near the beginning of chapter four, um, and we're about to talk about velocity vectors. Um, these concept of velocity in two and three dimensions is very similar to that in one dimension, except the, again that vectors are involved, and so that complicates things a little bit but not too much. Uh, as a bit of background, the instantaneous velocity is uh, just the derivative of the equation for the position vector. So, you know, velocity is um, the derivative of position or displacement, uh, which is, you know, the same as in one dimension. <clears throat> um, in uh, setting up that equation, we start out looking at it as a limit. Uh, velocity at a given, or as a function of time, is actually the limit as the time interval approaches zero of um, the position vector at a later time minus the position vector at an earlier time, uh, the later time given by t plus delta t, um, and the earlier time given by just t. Uh, and that's divided by the time interval, which again is approaching zero. Or another way of writing that is just the derivative of the position vector r with respect to time. Uh, the little sketch there, isn't that important? You can look in the book and see what they drew if you want. And it's actually better than what I can do. Moving on here, um, in terms of components, the position vector could be written as the x term with respect to time times the uh, unit vector in the x direction, which is of course i. Um, the y uh, position with respect to time times j and the z uh, position with respect to time times k. <clears throat> and each of these terms uh, for the velocity uh, would be the, the velocity uh, of say the velocity in the x direction as a function of time would be the derivative of the position with respect to time um, in the x direction. And the velocity in the y direction with respect to time would be the derivative of the position in the y direction with respect to time. And this, you know, similar for the z direction. <clears throat> or another way of saying it is that the average velocity is just the difference in the position vector at a later time minus the position vector at an earlier time over the time interval itself, t2 minus t1. <clears throat> um, probably a better way to do this would be just to show an actual example. So uh, calculating a velocity vector. Uh, if you have a particle that has a position function uh, that's given by uh, vector r as a function of time, that is the, the displacement or position with a um, with respect to time is equal to 2t squared times uh, unit vector i plus 2 plus 3t times unit vector j plus 5t times unit vector k. And the entire underlying thing is all the one equation. And what we want to do here is find the instantaneous velocity and the speed at two seconds first of all, and then find the average velocity between one and three seconds. The solution is to take the derivative of the position function with respect to time. And I didn't show that step-by-step step in my notes, so I will do that here just as a reminder of how to do a derivative. Okay, so here's your function, uh, your position function. The derivative of that is where you essentially um, multiply the coefficient by the current exponent of each uh, variable, and then reduce the variable by one. <clears throat> so for 2t squared, this would be equivalent to 
two because of the power um, times 2.0, which is the original coefficient, times t to the two minus one times unit vector i. And we can clean that up you know, and make it look nicer later. For the next term, two is just a number. And the derivative of just a number with no variable attached to it is zero. And the reason for that is that you could think of two as being uh, you know, just a number by itself. You can think of that as being the, that number times the variable to the zero power. You know, because any anything to the zero power is one. So two is equivalent to being two t to the zero power. Well, according to the conventions of how you take a derivative, if you have this, then what you would do is you would take that <clears throat> exponent zero and multiply it by the coefficient, and then multiply it by uh, the variable to a power one less than what it originally was. So 2t to the zero power would become zero times two to the t minus one. Zero times anything is zero, of course, so that whole term drops out. So it's easy, it's just to remember that if you have just a number, the derivative is zero. So that's gonna be zero plus, uh, plus the 3t now. <clears throat> 3t to the first power, the derivative is going to be one times 3.0 times t to the zero, which is, you know, one minus one. Here, let me write it like that actually, just to be consistent. J, okay, and then five T times unit vector K. Uh, T is to the first power again, so that's gonna be one times 5.0 times t to the one minus one k. And now to clean all this up and uh, make it look nice, uh, two times two is 4.0 times t, two minus one is one. So that would be t just to the one. And we don't normally write the one, so I'll just leave it like 4t. Okay, plus zero plus um, <clears throat> one times three is 3.0. T to the one minus one is T to the zero power. Anything to the zero power is one. So this is just gonna be three plus uh, one times five is 5.0 times T to the one minus one. Again, that's T to the zero and anything to the zero power is just one. So the T itself disappears and that will be times unit vector K. Okay, and this will be, since it's a derivative of a position that will be a velocity and that's meters per second. <clears throat> and that is indeed what we end up with for the derivative. The velocity is the derivative of the position and it ends up as 4.0 T times unit vector I plus 3.0 times unit vector j plus 5.0 times unit vector k, which is what we got when we worked it out. <clears throat> so that worked out fortunately. Uh, that's the equation for instantaneous velocity right there. If you want the instantaneous velocity at any given moment, then you can just uh, specify the time and insert the time into the equation. Okay, so the velocity at two seconds would be four times time, which is two seconds. So that's four times two or eight times unit vector i plus three times, well, there's no t uh, term there. So the two seconds doesn't really matter. It's still 3.0 times j. And the same with the final term, it's just 5.0, there's no time factor involved here. So it's still just 5.0 K. So this is the equation for the velocity at two seconds. 
this is the velocity at two seconds because you notice it's a, it's a um, vector equation, but they were asking for the speed at two seconds. And the speed is the magnitude of velocity, uh, the i and j and k terms specify the direction of the velocity. And for speed, you need to basically get rid of those. You just want the magnitude. And to find the magnitude of velocity, uh, you just take the square root of the x term squared plus the y term squared plus the z term squared. So that's square root of 8 squared plus 3 squared plus 5 squared, which works out to be square root of 98, which is 9.90 meters per second. That's the speed at uh, two seconds. Uh, question B was to find the average velocity between one and three seconds. So what you're going to have to do is basically find the velocity at three seconds and the velocity at one second and basically uh, add them up and, or sorry, uh, take the difference and divide by the time interval. So the um, position, oh, sorry, no, it's the, you're, you're going to have to find the uh, uh, position vectors at one and three seconds and then divide them by the time interval. <clears throat> so the uh, position vector at three seconds, again, it's going to be going back to the original equation now, since this is the um, position vector uh, that we need. So it's going to be two times the time squared, and that's three seconds, if we're taking the position at three seconds, plus two plus three times the time, which is three seconds, times j, plus five times the time, which is three seconds, times k. And that's meters. And when you work all that out, two times three so squared is 18, I plus 11J plus 15K. And that is the equation for the position vector at three seconds. You can do the same thing at one second, which is a little simpler to, to insert one for the time. And you get this equation here, <clears throat> 2I plus 5J plus 5K. For the average velocity, you just take uh, the position vector at three seconds, minus the position vector at one second over three minus one seconds, which is two seconds, of course. And to do that, we look back at what the position, position vectors were. Uh, at three seconds, it was this. And at one second, it was this. So basically it's this minus this over two seconds. And this, so that's what we have, this minus this over three minus one or two seconds. <clears throat> to subtract them, what you do is you um, bring together the, um, terms that are multiplied by the unit vectors in each direction. So the I terms, the I term that is would be 18 minus two. So there you go. And the J term would be 11 minus five. So there you go. And the K term would be 15 minus five. And there you go. So that ends up being 16 I plus nine J plus 10 K over two seconds, which ends up being 8i plus 4.5j plus 5k meters per second, which actually happens to be the same as what we found up here at two seconds. So the average velocity between one and three seconds is the same as the velocity at two seconds. And basically what that means is that velocity is linear. So it's not changing. <clears throat> All right, so um, as another example, if you have a particle with a position function as a function of time, uh, r, you know, vector r as a function of time is 3t to the third i plus 4j. There's only one time term here, and that's um, the, in the x direction. So what is the inst <laughs> sorry instantaneous velocity at three seconds? Well, the first thing, again, is uh, you have to find the velocity equation by taking the derivative of the position vector equation. And so you need the uh, 
derivative of 3t to the third plus four, essentially. So that's, um, you're going to take basically the exponent times the coefficient. So that's three times three times t to the three minus one power. And that will be times i plus the derivative, again, of if it's just a number with no variable in it, then the derivative is zero. So that's plus zero j. And when you work this out, three times three is nine, and t to the three minus one is t squared. And so it's nine t squared i. And that is the velocity um, equation for this particle. At three seconds, you just uh, substitute three seconds in for t. So nine times three squared, which is nine, is 81i. And so that is your velocity equation, uh, the velocity vector rather, at um, three seconds. <clears throat> and in the second part, it wants to know what is the average velocity between two and four seconds. Again, you have to approach that um, very similarly to the way we did in the last example, where you find the velocity at four seconds, find the velocity, or sorry, the position at four seconds, find the position at two seconds, uh, take the position at four minus the position at two, and divide it by four minus two. So the position at four seconds, uh, going back to the original equation for the position vector, 3t uh, to the third i plus 4j, all you have to do is substitute 4 in for the time. And so it's 3 times 4 to the third plus 4. Uh, so that's 192i plus 4j meters. <clears throat> the position at 2 seconds is 3 times 2 to the third i plus 4j. So that's 24i plus 4j. And for the average velocity, you just basically subtract this minus this divided by 4 minus 2. So again, it's uh, 192i minus 4j minus 24i plus 4j over 4 minus 2 seconds. And you can bring the i terms together and the j terms together. So it's 192 minus 24i plus 4 minus 4j. So that's a 168i uh, I plus 0j divided by 2, and which gives you 84i meters per second, which is close to the velocity at um, 3 seconds, but not quite the same. So the velocity is changing over time. It's not linear. <clears throat> All right, so since we're dealing in two and three directions, <clears throat> we might have to change, consider velocities or uh, positions in two different directions at the same time. And uh, in doing that, it's useful to remember uh, the fact that, or keep in mind the fact that um, perpendicular motions are independent of each other. You can have motion in two different directions at the same time. And those motions normally are not coupled with each other. They act independently of each other. And one good example of that, uh, we can go through all this stuff here. Uh, horizontal motion usually has no effect on the ver vertical motion and vice versa. And one good example is that if you take two baseballs or any other kind of ball and throw them si or simultaneously anyway, you drop one of them from a given height and you throw the other one horizontally from that same height at the same moment. So you get two motions that are essentially like this. The ball that you drop is going to go straight down until it hits the ground. The ball that you throw horizontally is going to follow what's called a projectile trajectory. And it's going to come um, go straight for a uh, straight horizontally for a little while. And then it's going to start falling toward the earth because of gravity. <clears throat> and the interesting thing, though, is that 
at any given moment, if you time, you know, if you were to take uh, a, a very um, picture uh, at uh, any given moment after releasing those two balls, the vertical height would be the same for them. So say at zero seconds, when you first release them, they're at the same height. At one second after releasing them, they are still at the same height. At two seconds after releasing them, they're still at the same height. At three seconds after releasing them, they're still at the same height. Although they have diverged horizontally, they are falling vertically at the same rate. And so that's, a, that's just a very simple demonstration of how horizontal and vertical motions, or in other words, motions in directions that are perpendicular to each other, are independent of each other. Because the um, horizontal movements are you know, basically diverging from each other, while the vertical um, movements are the same. <clears throat> OK, so the vertical position or motion is independent of the horizontal position or motion. And that's because both balls are accelerating downward because of gravity. And that gives them a downward acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. The horizontal ball is traveling horizontally at a constant velocity, uh, assuming that there's no air resistance. And this is where the theory sometimes fails to live up to real world um, conditions, because the theory does assume that there's no friction and no air resistance. Uh, you know, of course, if you're throwing a real ball, there probably will be some air resistance and that might cause some deviation from the theory in this case. But um, if there's no air resistance, then the um, ball that you throw horizontally is going in the X direction at a constant speed. It doesn't slow down and it doesn't speed up. But in the Y direction, it does speed up going downward and it speeds up at the same rate as the ball that you drop without throwing it sideways. And so again, the horizontal and vertical directions are not dependent on each other. Okay, so in this particular case, well, actually in both cases, you can resolve the motion of the ball into horizontal and vertical components. Uh, for the ball thrown to the side fo following the projectile trajectory, the horizontal and vertical components are both significant. And we'll see that in a little while when we start dealing with projectile motion. For the ball that's dropped, the vertical component obviously is very important and the horizontal component is essentially zero. So, or in other words, there is no horizontal component. <clears throat> okay, so moving on with uh, acceleration. Uh, instantaneous acceleration at any given moment is just the derivative of the velocity vector with respect to time at the moment of interest. And now that we're dealing in two and three dimensions, acceleration is a vector, or we have to involve vectors in the equation solving for acceleration. Uh, of course, acceleration has always been a vector, but we've been able to get away without dealing with vectors in solving the equations when we were dealing in one dimension. Now that we're dealing in two and three dimensions, we're gonna have to use vector equations to solve for acceleration. Um, if you wanna look at it as a limit, Acceleration can be thought of as the limit as the time interval gets smaller and smaller and smaller and approaches zero of the difference between the velocity at some later time and the velocity at some earlier time divided by the time interval itself. Or in other words, just the velocity of, uh, or sorry, the derivative of velocity with respect to time. The components for acceleration can be thought of as just the derivative of the velocity in each separate direction with respect to time. So in the x direction, it would be the, the derivative of velocity in the x direction with respect to time times unit vector i and, and so on. <clears throat> also, you can think of acceleration as being the second derivative of position or displacement 
which would be written as uh, acceleration is equal to d squared x over dt squared uh, in each case. And second derivative, what that all that really means is that you take the derivative and you take the derivative again. So uh, for acceleration, if you start with position, you take the derivative and you get velocity, and then you take the derivative of velocity and you get acceleration. That's just another way of saying acceleration is the second derivative of position. <clears throat> okay, um, an example of that would be, uh, see, finding an acceleration vector. Uh, if an object has a velocity, given by this equation here. Velocity as a function of time is 5t times i plus t squared times j plus negative 2t to the third times k meters per second. What is the acceleration vector at two seconds? And find its magnitude and direction. Okay, so the first thing you have to do if you want acceleration is take the derivative of velocity. If we've got 5t times i, then the i term, once we take the derivative, is going to be, uh, t here is to the first, it's going to be 1 times 5 to the t, times t, rather, to the 1 minus 1. So 1 times 5 times t to the 1 minus 1, that's the i term. And that, of course, just works out to 5, because t to the 1 minus 1 is t to the 0, and anything to the 0 power is just 1. So five times i. The next, the j term, uh, we have t squared. So that's going to be two times t to the two minus one power, or in other words, two t. And the k term is going to be three times negative two times t to the three minus one, okay? And when you work that out, that's negative 6t squared. And so there is the equation for the acceleration vector. If you want the acceleration at two seconds, then you just insert two seconds for the times, as we do over on the next page here. And I rewrote the um, equation for the acceleration vector again. And inserting two seconds for each time, we get 5i plus 2 times 2j plus 6 times 2 squared k. So that's 5i plus 4j minus 24k meters per second squared. This actually can be considered to be giving the direction of the acceleration vector in terms of uh, unit vectors. So we found the acceleration at two seconds. And we also, uh, this can qualify as giving the direction. The magnitude uh, will just again be the square root of the x uh, term squared plus the y term squared plus the z term squared. So that's the square root of five squared plus four squared plus negative 24 squared, which is the square root of 617. And that works out to 24.8 meters per second squared. That's the magnitude of the acceleration. If you want the direction as an angle, then you could always use the equation theta equals inverse tangent y over x, which gives you 38.7 degrees from the uh, uh, x-axis. OK, so I'm going to end the first segment there. We're a little over time anyway, and we'll pick up with example 4.5 after the, uh, in the next uh, segment, rather. <laughs>